Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to your favorite show on YouTube slash LawTube, Raw Law Unfiltered, with your favorite host, the DUI Guy Plus. Boy, oh boy, what a treat do I have for you today. Okay, first of all, we have to begin at the beginning. How did we get here? How did we even arrive at this idea? A couple of days ago, I did a video about Judge DeThomasis and why he enjoys absolute immunity. That's why my hashtag buckle up Judge DeThomasis is right here next to my name or instead of my name. Why uh, I was trying to figure out why and how we could lift the absolute immunity from this judge. And I came to the conclusion that he is, I mean, very well protected. Absolute immunity, judges enjoy it, prosecutors enjoy it. It's very, very, very difficult to remove immunity from a judge. Then today, we're going to be joined by my good friend, John Bryan of West Virginia, who is actually not far from me, uh, geographically speaking. I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, he had a case where apparently... The, these are the facts. This is the TLDR. We're actually going to share it on screen so that you guys can um, understand uh, what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, you're going to see John. I can't, I can't mute him, but he's or, or remove him, but uh, uh, or maybe I can. Here we go. Sorry, John. I'll be right with you. Um, circuit court judge, right? This is this is the ruling. This is literally the ruling. Judge Wilkinson in circuit court said, we consider in this appeal whether a judge who participates in the search of a litigant's home is entitled to judicial immunity for actions related to the search. Judge Luis Goldston went to Matthew Gibson's residence, the defendant's home, to look for items he had failed to turn over to his ex-wife after their divorce. What? This is unprecedented stuff. She entered his home over his objections. He's saying, no, do not come in. She said, yes, I am. I am the law. I am the judge. And then she threatens him. If you try and stop me, I am going to arrest you. She then supervised the seizure and designated items in the house. The only question before us, said the, the, the court of appeals, is whether judicial immunity shields the judge's acts. And they held, get this, it does not. Judicial immunity only protects judicial acts. It does not shield the conduct of judges who step outside their judicial role. And Judge Goldston did exactly that when searching Gibson's home. She basically became a police officer. She basically put herself in the shoes of a police officer or investigator or I mean, for God's sake, even prosecutors very rarely, very rarely will you find even a prosecutor going into a person's home, let alone a judge. Anyway, without further ado, I present to you the civil rights lawyer, John Bryan. How are you, John? Good, Larry. How are you doing? Good. You sound exhausted. Yeah, this is this is getting close to my bedtime here. <laughs> you're, you're an old man like me. I get that. So listen... Uh, I, I actually I understand this is uh, uh, this case has an anniversary today. What is the anniversary? Yeah, it just uh, coincidentally today is the four year anniversary of the date that my client's house was searched by the judge. So four years ago today, right before the world shuts down, March fourth, twenty twenty, Judge uh, Goldston goes into your client, uh, Mister Gibson's home, and searches it. That's right. Um, you represented Mr. Gibson. Yep. Tell us about that. What was that experience like? Well, you know, my uh, assistant basically got a call that, hey, a, a judge had searched my house. And as you know, when you when you get a lot of calls from prospective clients, I mean, your, your staff is sort of trained and they by experience, learn to recognize, you know, something that you may be interested in. So when the call came in to Amanda, who, who is my longtime paralegal, who, who answers the phones that, all right, a judge had searched my house. She, you know, it basically came running to me. It's like, I got something that you might really might be interested in sort of thing. And, you know, this guy says a judge searches house. So so I met, you know, I, I met with him kind of, you know, as soon as possible and he had video of it 
and I basically couldn't couldn't believe you know what I was seeing, and I had never, you know, I had, I had, I I sue police officers generally. I sue the government for like police action. I had never, I don't think, sued a judge before, but I had never heard of something like this happening. So I didn't immediately know what the answer was of whether or not this was unconstitutional or whether something could be done about it. And trying to search for it really didn't yield many results of of, prior situations where you could see because it just didn't really happen before. So, but, you know, I took a firm stance from day one when I saw that, that, you know, this has to be constitutional unconstitutional. I mean, it it just has to be. And I ran with it at that point and kind of never looked back. And it got traction from day one because that I was just kind of, I had just started my YouTube channel a couple months before that. And I had accidentally started my YouTube channel because I needed to, I had this other kind of crazy video of these narcotics cops, this task force breaking into my client's house, like literally slithering in the windows, busting in, breaking in, burglarizing the house. And they were caught on surveillance cameras inside the house. And it it was all on video. And so I wanted to get this footage out there as quickly as possible. And that's literally why I started my YouTube channel. And that was in like January of 2020. So it only been like the first couple of months. So couple months later in walks this this other kind of crazy video of this judge searching this guy's house so what do i do i put it on youtube of course Hmm. and it kind of went viral at least as i thought viral was at that time you know it went like maybe fifty thousand views or something like that but all kind of through west virginia and it was so it was like it got a lot of local interest next thing you know local tv reporters were, were were calling and they were interested so i was like all right meet us at my client's house. And so I went to my client's house with my, my son at the time. And we showed reporters where this had happened. We showed them the video and my client kind of did a walkthrough of what happened. And so they aired it on the TV news. And so it really got traction in West Virginia that then caught the attention of the judicial disciplinary people. Oh, they saw that. I don't know if they saw it first on YouTube or on TV or what, but like it immediately caught their attention. And like the day of or the next day, they opened a judicial disciplinary investigation and almost immediately came down to the county where this happened and interviewed the judge under oath. And that from day one locked the judge into her position on what her actions were what her alleged justification was and so from that time forward the the disciplinary case sort of a prosecution went forward and that went all the way to the west virginia supreme court so it was kind of contested by the judge at first the family court judges sort of in the state rallied around her and tried to make the case that she was allowed to do this and a lot of the family family law bar especially local to her rallied around her as well, even went on TV and said, Oh yeah, you know, that they have the ability to do this family law judges do to, you know, it's not a criminal case. It's a family law case. They're allowed to go to the, the homes and see if items of personal property there. And so this was not at all a sure thing at the beginning. They were disputing this, the family law judges and the family law lawyers, they were making the case that this was perfectly acceptable. And meanwhile, other people, such as myself, were like taken aback. Like, what do you mean this has been happening before? So is that, that her? Is that her in the tan? Pandora's box. Is that is that her in the? I'm playing the video yeah. right now, John. Yeah, I found this, it on your. This is the video from four years ago today, mm-hmm. where ten minutes earlier they had been in a courtroom mm-hmm. in Raleigh County, West Virginia, in a family court courtroom. And so this was like a post-divorce hearing. The divorce had had been finalized around a year earlier. And there was a petition for contempt filed by- Is that the judge right here? Yeah, that's the judge. That's the the judge on the the person's property. That's the lawyer for the ex-wife to the left. But that's the judge. And who's recording this? Who's got the camera? My client does. Got it. No, 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 no. No, my client did not. 
it was his it was his girlfriend, I believe. Girlfriend. Okay. Yeah, that's my client there in the blue shirt. Okay. Um, but he knew like he knew this was happening and it was bizarre. And so he had his girlfriend there and recording. And the first thing that he did was record himself going up to the judge in his own front yard and saying, you know, judge, I'm making a motion to recuse you because you've inserted your, because you have a conflict of interest, you've, you know, whatever, something like that. And so he made a motion for the judge basically to recuse herself or disqualify herself because of what was then happening in his front yard. And then the judge said, your motion is denied. It's not timely filed. And then this is all on video. My client says, well, I want a search warrant. You're not getting in my house without a search warrant. And she says, oh, yes, I am. And she threatens him several times with being arrested. And she forces him to turn off the video recording. Meanwhile, he continues to audio record, or he attempts to, and eventually the ex-wife's lawyer catches on that he's audio recording, and he informs the judge that he's recording, and so then the judge, again, threatens to arrest him and forces him to stop the audio recording, and that's when they all go inside, and the search takes place inside my client's house, and then there's a little bit of footage that ended up coming from inside the house that was captured by the bailiff who had, had recorded. I don't recall how many minutes of it were recorded, but so we do have some footage that happened on the inside. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they're looking for photos and DVDs. Yeah. So there was, there was a list of items of personal property that were part of the final divorce order. I mean, and it was that, it was kind of that specific. It was like down to DVDs and, and, and family photos. And so the allegation was, and, he, and you can see kind of how rudimentary my YouTube videos were at that point. Like I, <laughs> like I was still just, I didn't, I wasn't even talking. I was just putting white letters on black background. Yeah. I didn't even have a microphone. So, uh, but anyways, the, the allegation from the ex-wife was, is that not all of these items of personal property that she was supposed to get out of the divorce agreement were ever turned over to her and, and that they were still inside my client's house. Mm -hmm. And so that was the issue that was before the court. And so she said, all right, where do you live? Mr. Gibson, I'll meet you there in 10 minutes and we'll go inside your house and we'll see if these items, your ex-wife says you never turned over or still inside your house. So that was the context of what was happening. And Mr. Gibson, my client was acting pro se at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, he had had a retained lawyer for the divorce. He was no longer represented by that lawyer in this contempt hearing a year later. So he was, he was representing himself acting as his own counsel and basically was completely ambushed, had no idea they would be going to his house. And so he had only had 10 minutes to sort of figure out what to do from the time that they left the hearing until the time that they arrived at his Can house. Drop for so a he, second? He, oh boy. Yeah. He, he was, I mean, he was very smart in getting what was to happen next on video and then making a motion to recuse the judge. And because this had been happening for 20 years, but nobody had stood up to it before. And my client is a federal law enforcement officer and was not easily intimidated. And so he was kind of the first one that had the, the guts to stand up to it. Mm -hmm. Not only that, because just because he did not have a lawyer, see what had happened for 20 years before is there were lawyers on both sides and they knew generally that this judge would do the, these sort of things. Wow. And so they weren't objecting to it. I mean, they were, they were sort of playing along with it. So if your lawyer is agreeing to the judge going in your house, then maybe it's difficult to establish a constitutional violation because you're agreeing to it essentially via your lawyer. But here he didn't have a lawyer who was playing along with that game. And he literally did object to it. He said, you're not going in my house without a warrant. And then that presented the situation that we had that, all right, now let's look at this issue. Can a family court judge go in your house 
Right. And violate your Fourth Amendment right. Is a warrant required? And it seemed that nobody knew the answer to this. But, you know, it it seemed obvious to me. Right. Right. So, okay. So now let's fast forward. You know, this was four years ago. The search happens. You file a motion to disqualify slash recuse. Different jurisdictions use different words to recuse the judge from the case. What happens with the recusal? Yeah, I mean it's it's very confusing. So I was never I was never his lawyer in the family court proceedings. Okay. Um did he get his recusal? I guess is, is my only question. I think the audience is curious about eventually, yeah. I mean eventually, I yeah. mean, once once I put the video on YouTube, the rest I mean, is history. Changed. I mean, and and that that is the important thing about YouTube. Transparency. It really it really is because what usually you are completely powerless against a judge or especially a family court judge who has ultimate discretion. I mean, you don't have juries. You just have this judge who can Mm -hmm. do whatever they want. So uh, only YouTube was, was able to get justice here because the the public saw this, the public was universally outraged. And again, generally what I do is sue um, over police misconduct. Right. That's, that's the most the, common jail. Like when they yeah. do, you know, those jail workers, the, the, the deputies at the jail, sometimes the deputies at the courthouse, but usually cops on the street is the most common that in jails. And, and that can be very divisive. Like everybody's yeah. got a position on one side or the other. Like they either have like the thin blue line position or they have, you know, the, the, the other position, like it's a very, very divisive issue. And, um, this not so much. This yeah. is maybe like maybe the one case I've ever had where like 99.99% of the population, like only excluding family court judges around the country, um, and not even all of them, everybody kind of was on our side on this case. Like, like everybody did not like this. Mm-hmm. And and so it was it was in that sense, it was like the easiest case I've ever had. But legally speaking. It was uh, it was the most difficult case because judges have absolute immunity. Mm-hmm. But as far as the public's um, perception of it, like everybody was against us. Everybody was upset with what they saw, and it was exposing what happened. If it wasn't on video, nothing ever would have happened here. It's only because it was caught on video, and only because then it was immediately put on YouTube, and then the TV news, and people saw it. That is what basically got results here, and and it did get results. It really couldn't have gone any better. Good. It was a long. It was a long ordeal, though. So you get this um, order, which I had on the screen a minute ago. Let me put it back. You get this order eventually. Let's fast forward in time to this is what twenty twenty three September. So just not that long ago, like five six months ago. Uh, it was argued. Did you have a uh, uh, what's it called oral argument? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there we had oral arguments at the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia, mm-hmm. and that was handled actually by the Institute for Justice. Oh, so, okay. That's another organization that I've been looking at. Uh, I haven't contacted them yet, and what the hell's maybe um, may, we may require their assistance for for the what the hell's is situation, Jeremy and George. Um, so it's decided October 30th, October 30th, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that more behind the scenes, John, the, the whole Institute for Justice, because that's one, or they're like the, I like to call them the ACLU of the First Amendment. Is that an accurate description? Absolutely. I, you know, I have a donation, in every YouTube video I publish, I have a donation link for the Institute for Justice, and they, they were kind enough to give me my own custom donation link so that every once in a while, like they could track and and tell me like how how many donation how much in donations like my audience from YouTube has donated nice. because I I really believe in their mission and this case shows exactly why and it was it was a long road before they ever got involved and just to give you a brief rundown on on how that happened like it was it was still it was still a lot happened before that so 
there was the entire judicial disciplinary case where the system really worked as it's supposed to. And the, the, the judge was held accountable for, you know, the, the code of judicial conduct. And that went all the way to the West Virginia Supreme court. And, um, while that was happening, it's, it's confusing procedurally while that was happening. Remember we have statutes of limitations and all that. So, um, you know, we, we can't just sit around and do nothing if we're going to file a civil lawsuit. So we filed a civil lawsuit before that was over. Mm -hmm. And so we filed a, a federal Section 1983 basic violation of constitutional rights lawsuit for money damages. And so that was pending at the same time. And mm -hmm. then the judicial disciplinary prosecution comes to an end and basically hammers the judge. It hammers the judge and says that you violated the constitution, the state constitution, you violated the federal constitution, you did all these bad things. Nice. And then ultimately, like it didn't remove her from the bench or anything. The ultimate punishment was, it was like a $5,000 fine. And essentially what the judge had agreed to, you know, at, at some point before she, you know, tried to, or tried to back out. But um, we got the Supreme Court order saying that everything that she did was bad, but most importantly, it was, it had no basis under West Virginia law, like, like the family law bar and other family, family law judges had been arguing. There, there was no doubt anymore. Once the West Virginia Supreme court, you know, put out that order, nobody could say that this was allowed under West Virginia laws. It mm -hmm. very clearly was not. And that helped us help me in the civil lawsuit. I was just by myself at that time. And I worked the case all the way up to jury trial. So I took I took depositions of the judge, of her bailiff, of the other sheriff's deputy who showed up at the scene, who also had been her longtime bailiff, and did all the uh, you know, dispositive motions. So they filed their, their motion for summary judgment, asserting absolute judicial immunity. We briefed that. And that was, I mean, that was a real threat that we were going to get dismissed on on the grounds of judicial immunity so i did the best as i could and i'm sort of a you know i'm sort of a trial lawyer a knuckle dragger like i like to go and throw bombs in the courtroom i'm not Hell a yeah. big butcher, but i did the best, <laughs> i did the best i could to to research and write these briefs on judicial immunity and there's not a lot out there so the trial judge the u.s district court judge like a week before jury trial. So we, we had all the jury instructions prepared. We had done all the motions in limine and everything. So we were set for trial. And then the judge finally ruled at the trial court level on judicial immunity. And it was of a great, they did. it was a great opinion. He denied the judge judicial immunity nice. and ordered that we were going, moving forward to trial, jury trial, nice. just days. Is, is this the order that I'm looking at or is it something else? No, that no, th this that is the order that came after this one was appealed. So the, the trial okay, court, so they appealed it. They appealed his decision, and they and it was affirmed at the higher court right here. Right, and, and it. because because it's it, because it's an immunity, just like qualified immunity, judicial immunity, they have the right to an interlocutory appeal, which, as you know, means that they get to appeal before the trial even. So usually, a defendant. In a, in a civil lawsuit would have to go through with the trial, see what happens, and then they can appeal, just like Trump, right? They, they have to go through the trial, then they can post the bond, and then they get to appeal. Well, not the government. When the government gets deprived of qualified immunity or judicial immunity, they get to appeal before the trial. So we had to put the trial on hold, and they got to appeal to the Fourth Circuit. That's what they did. But it had gotten enough attention at that point because it was so unusual that I, I it got the attention of the Institute for Justice. So I got contacted by um, Patrick Giacomo um, with and Anya Bidwell with the Institute for Justice. And they were like super excited because it fit in with what kind of what their fight is. And they're fighting against all these judicial immunities and qualified immunities, government immunities, essentially. And they took over the appellate work, which was fantastic because they're like top notch. That's what they do, like the best yeah. in the country. And they wrote the brief and uh, Patrick Giacomo did the oral arguments. I was I was sitting right behind him watching him. <laughs> I'm sure that was an experience. 
yeah, it, it, it was great. And it was, it was only a few months ago or six months ago now. And yeah. It's it, kind of hard to believe that it's been this recent. So, yeah. so after they, after they argue this, um, you know, an oral argument, this decision is comes down October 30th, you know, barely uh, Halloween, you know, or right the day before Halloween. And they make this decision. They affirm that judicial immunity is lifted off of uh, Judge Goldston, and because she stepped outside of her judicial role and she was not acting in the capacity of the judge. So let me fill you in on our protagonist, antagonist. I mean, at this point, he he has so many different names. He's got Grudge Judge. He's got you know Judge Debiases. He's got uh, Judge, uh, I hate Mark Feather, Brr, Mark Feather. You know, you're not going to get that reference because you, uh, you, John, by the way, for the record, don't, don't, please, please do not, you know, be like, oh, you need to watch this. John, like me, is a full-time attorney, okay? YouTube is, please stop me if I'm wrong, John, at any point. I don't want to put words in your mouth. John is a full-time attorney. He litigates 1983 actions against police officers and sometimes judges, apparently, and YouTube is kind of like an extra exposure, extra income slash hobby. Is that correct? Yeah, it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's, it's supposed uh, to be. But yeah, it's another I'm, way to get the, the word out there. And the reason you've garnered such a following, which, by the way, congratulations on that, because I literally watched you kind of do this. And then all of a sudden you were like, whoop. And I was like, what the hell happened here? Because John is all about transparency of the police the court system, judicial behavior, officer behavior, prosecutorial behavior, just like me. I do very, very similar things. Only John does it in the capacity of suing police officers for their misdeeds. I re usually represent them in criminal court. We win the case, get the case dismissed, whatever. And then I would pass the case over to John and be like, okay, John, now you take over. Now you sue the government, sue their fucking pants off rip their balls off and and make money off of them right yeah that's the idea that's the idea so why did i want to talk to john about this case because this case that's it it's over it, october 30th it was decided it was reset for jury trial and um i, I don't think you you talked about this yet john but i'm just gonna fill the audience in uh the case is now settled right R a couple weeks before trial john settled this case and he got, am I allowed to reveal the number to our public? Yeah, I, it's already been out there. It's already been out there. John got his client a whopping $200,000. 200 grand for the judge violating another person's Fourth Amendment rights. And just let me take a second, John, please bask in the glory. I'm going to give you a clap for that because that is outstanding fucking work outstanding yeah i mean people will say well it should be 200 million dollars but you know you you know better the, the, a, the, it can be, you can only get so much okay like we're not right. suing a pharmaceutical company for killing a bunch of people that would be in the millions um so still fantastic absolutely uh a uh, phenomenal result now Judge the Thomases. So for those of you just joining us um, for the what the hails portion of this video, basically, uh, if you have not been following, we have a very interesting scenario. And John, I'm going to fill you and the chat in uh, in a moment. And I just want to hear your thoughts because I know you have you have not had the chance to really follow this case because you're a full time attorney. And uh, again, nobody's faulting you for that. If anybody gives you shit, please let me know and, and I will and I will punch them in the face. OK. Uh, Kevin Cotter says, has John been following the Hales case? So that's the answer, Kevin. Not yet. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. He's got other things on his plate. The reason I brought him in is this. Okay, you ready? Judge DeThomasis in Levy County, Florida, had a petition for injunction for or a petition slash injunction for stalking against a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Hales. It is a classic pot calling the kettle black scenario. John and his wife, uh, George, excuse me, I, I always say Jeremy, Jeremy and his wife, George, she goes by George to protect her identity. It's her middle name. She's Egyptian. So they use the, the middle name uh, uh, is, is like the father, you know, it gets 
gets passed down. So Jeremy and George moved to Levy County, Florida, because what they're treasure hunters. That's all they want. They want to they want to look for treasure, and they want they have a, an enormous following. Almost they may have already crossed seven hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, and that's their passion. This is what they do. This is what they want. This is what they like. And they moved and no good deed goes unpunished because they're philanthropists. They teach people how to be entrepreneurs, how to like buy storage units and sell them, make money that way, rent them out. They do a whole bunch of philanthropic giving money to organizations they believe in things. Well, there are two individuals by the name of Lynette and John. Lynette Preston, she also goes by Michelle. So Lynette Michelle Preston and John Cook. Uh, they have a lot of nicknames. They have a lot of multi like, I think she has like 39 different names. She's a former stripper, but none of that matters. None of that matters. What matters is they move and they follow, they stalk Jeremy and George. They purchase a property like a year after Jeremy and George moved to the area across the street, across the fucking street, John across the street from this couple. And all they want is give me money, give me money, give me money. They start this bullshit turtle rescue, uh, which uh, apparently they have tortoises dying on the premises. She has a four-year-old daughter, which had, when was the last time you heard a four-year-old still in diapers, John? It's almost like it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what is happening in, in Levy County, Florida. And so Jeremy and George, uh, they try to seek a protective order against this woman and, and John, but primarily her. And they go to Ohio, and I believe they get an, an order against both of them because Ohio looks at it and goes, holy shit, granted. And Florida refuses to accept it. Florida says, no, we're not granting you any injunction. But Lynette, the brilliant woman that she is, decides to run to the courthouse and say, you know what? I want an injunction against him. And so a hearing is scheduled. She files it September 7th. So right around the time when you are getting ready to get this uh, order on your case, right, you know, 400, 500 miles away, south, down south, you have this rogue judge, Judge de Thomas's. Judge, his full name is Craig Constantine de Thomas's. This judge takes, takes this petition, and uh, it's uh, the first one is 50 pages on September 7th. He schedules a hearing, the first hearing is held, and here's where it begins. This is where we want your input, John. This judge, um, and we're not going to watch the hearing. It, it is it is very long. I know Megan uh, Fox writer. She uh, she was doing a watch party, and I kind of was able to join in. I was driving, so my internet was going in and out. But I was able to join for parts of it, and I could hear. I finally he heard with my own ears how Judge the Thomases is acting. First of all, Lynette is unrepresented at this juncture. Okay, in September October of twenty uh, twenty three. She is pro se, meaning representing herself, for those of you who don't know in the chat. So she is pro se, and judge that, and Jeremy is represented. He's got Mr. Mark Feather. Brr, Mark Feather. Um, so Mark Feather is representing Jeremy. She's unrepresented. She's the petitioner. He's the respondent. Judge de Thomas's literally sits there, listens to her evidence, periodically, you know, uh, uh, filling in some gaps. She interrupts the judge constantly, and he just lets her. He just lets her talk over him. He doesn't try to silence her like, ma'am, you need to obey the court. You need to listen. None of that. Just complete and utter rogueness, if you will. And, um, and, and he's giving her carte blanche to speak, speak over him, interrupt him. Like at, at some moment, I remember even I said, I said, Megan, is who's the judge in this courtroom? Because it feels like Lynette is literally the judge of her own case. And, and the Thomas is kind of like the arbiter of, you know, he's going to decide like, yes, I agree with you. Jeremy hasn't had a chance to speak yet. And by the way, Jeremy hasn't had a chance to speak yet to this day. And uh, we're not going to get to that because it gets very complicated. If you all are uh, want to hear more about it, it's in the, uh, it's not in the description, but in it's in my playlists. If you want to find all the videos related to this situation, but with respect to judicial immunity, absolute immunity for judges, John. This is the question, okay? Then this is what I've been grappling with. And when I saw your case, when I saw your victory, I was like, you know what? Maybe not all hope is lost because I will admit, I always admit when I'm wrong. 
In my previous video, somebody asked me, can, can Judge the Thomases be sued in any way, shape, or form, capacity, or whatever? And I was like, no, I don't think so. It looks like absolute immunity absolutely shields him. He is absolutely protected. He's got his armor, and piercing it is pretty much impossible short of him performing non-judicial act. Oh. Enter John Bryan. Non-judicial acts. Uh, this is what I missed because there is no precedent. As you literally heard previously, this is straight from the horse's mouth. The man, the myth, the legend himself who helped litigate this case. I won't give you all the credit because Institute for Justice was obviously all over it. But the key is you've, you've penetrated, you've pierced the judicial uh, immunity, the absolute immunity veil. We finally learned that absolute does not always mean absolute. I always like the joke, would you like a cookie? Absolutely, I would like a cookie. No one is going to come to you and say, are you sure? I'm not so certain that you really want a cookie. You know, it, it makes no sense. Absolutely means absolutely means absolutely, but not in the law, not in the legal sense. Sometimes absolute means yes, but yes, it's absolute, except there's some exceptions. And in uh, the case of Judge uh, uh, Goldston, Goldston, there was a clear exception. The judge acted, acted as a police officer searching the person's home. Now, in D Judge De Thomas's courtroom, there is an argument to be made, and this needs to be examined. And I'm happy to be of assistance to Jeremy and George because this is going to be a brand new case. First of all, he's got the case. Uh, where he's the respondent, Lynette is trying to get the petition against him. He may have a defamation case because Lynette has actually called herself out in one of her petitions. If you've not seen yesterday's video, you have to check it out. She actually took a photocopy of what she was calling a Jeremy, and it's heinous. And she admitted to it, like, yes, this is my handwriting. This is my this is my post. This is my thing. I'm like, you're a moron. You're a complete monkey, and and I think DJ Radis even made made a, a, a song out of it because it's it's just it's bonkers, it's bonkers. And so now you have this this judge who is acting in both the capacity of a judge and a litigator. He is both representing; it's like a veiled representing of a, a petitioner in a stalking case petition, and he's acting as a judge. So. In your opinion, again, with, I know you haven't seen the video, and um, I'm not going to ask you to. And obviously, I didn't prepare you for this. But because you have this experience of, of getting a judge's absolute immunity removed, is it possible, based on the case law that you have researched in your own case, when a judge steps into the shoes of a, uh, an attorney for the petitioner, Again, this is un this is unprecedented ground. There is no precedent. There are no cases that I can think of that exist on this particular issue. We now have the Goldston uh, situation, but is it is it possible to sue now? The Gibson versus Goldston now as stare decisis, which is a Latin term for previous cases that we can look to. What do you think, John? Does Jeremy have something here potentially? Well, you know it's. It's funny that this is happening in in Levy County, Florida. I don't know if you if you know this, but I'm from Florida. I grew up in Florida. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm. I grew up in Florida. I, I grew up on. I grew up in in Melbourne, Florida. It's on the other side of the state. Um, but I halfway grew up in a small county up in Northwest Florida called Levy County, <laughs> and sort of my family farm is in Levy County. That's where my that's where my family's from is that area. And so wow. small world. Um, my brother still lives there on on sort of our our family ranch. Um we we own property all over in in Levy County. I've been to Otter Creek. I know exactly where it is. And Levy County is a tiny place in Florida. Wow. I mean it's not people mm -hmm. wouldn't have people don't have any idea Florida's like that. They they think, you know, Florida on the coast um, popular, but but Levy County, Florida is very much like the rural counties near where I live now in West Virginia. You know, around what 30, 40,000 people or something in the county. I mean, very, very small county for Florida. And my my family goes back there. My family has lived in that area since like the 1850s, 1840s. So 
of all the places where this is happening, Levy County, like I half of my life I grew up there. So I'm very familiar with Levy County. In fact, the only trouble I've ever been in in my life was for allegedly killing an alligator in Levy County when I was in college. You know, when everyone else was in on spring break down in the Keys getting DUIs and getting in other <laughs> trouble. I was staying out of trouble with with my girlfriend and and friends up in up in Levy County, and we end up getting in trouble up there for allegedly killing an alligator. That's the only legal trouble I've ever been in in my life was in Levy County, Florida. So it's funny that of all the places where this is, happens, is is where I've lived kind of half my life there, and 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 I love I love Levy County, but. Um, so that being said, I don't know this judge, you know, I, I, I don't know Levy County anymore to, to that extent. I don't have any connection with this judge. I don't know anything about, about the judge or any of the parties involved. Um, but based on what you told me, I mean, the other thing I'll say about Florida, I mean, it's Florida, there's so much red tape, right? So I, I see some of this has to do with like water meters and stuff like that. That's one of the reasons I moved to West Virginia. I love West Virginia is Florida is no matter what they claim, despite what they claim, Florida is a big government state. It's a police state. There are politicians everywhere. There are cops everywhere. Go try to speed in Florida. That's what that's why I do what I do, because I learned to dislike the government from an early age because I saw my law-abiding parents even getting abused by police officers. There are so many cops in Florida because there's wealthy old people, and old people are afraid of their shadow. They're afraid of everything. So that's why there's so many cops in Florida. Like, everything is illegal. There's cops everywhere. Like, you can't speed. And they have nothing else to do other than set up these speed traps all over the place. So there's cops everywhere in Florida, you know, Levy County included. So if you have 40,000 people in that county, and 40,000 people in Greenbrier County, West Virginia, like we, we might have 12 cops on duty in Greenbrier County, West Virginia, and they probably have 1,200 in Levy County total. I mean, big yeah. government is, is a big thing in Florida. Everything's illegal. There's government everywhere. So that's kind of what's underneath, you know, all this. I know without even knowing the particular facts. Okay, you know, Florida is at it down for a long time on how to harass people. And you think you can just move down there and live your life and be free. Well, you can't. And that's that's why West Virginia is so great. That's why people from Florida move to West Virginia, because you can come up here. You don't have to worry about even building codes and all this crap. Go to Florida. You got to pay every kind of fee there is. You got to you got to follow every kind of code there is. And if the government wants to harass you, they're going to harass you. So I, I can see stuff like like this happening. All right. So that being said, I, and I've got a lot of phone calls in the past several years on a judge did this to me or a judge did that to me. Can I sue the judge? I don't know how many phone calls I've had, how many emails I've had. The two basic ways, if you want to sue a judge, there are really only two scenarios, only two like teeny tiny ways that you could possibly theoretically do it. One is if um, a judge is acting entirely in without any jurisdiction at all. So judge, is it Thomasus? The Thomasus. So I don't even have a case pending before judge Thomasus, but he walks up to me on the sidewalk and spits in my face. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I sue judge Thomasus. That's and the example that I gave in my immunity, immunity video. Does he get it? No, because I don't have a case pending before him. It has nothing to do with him being a judge. Um, it, it has nothing to do with his job as a judge at all. So that's that's an easy scenario. The other way and the more common way and the way that, that we had to litigate in this case is like, all right, the judge does have some jurisdiction over this individual, over the plaintiff, but the judge stepped outside the capacity of a judge and stepped into some other capacity. So in the, the Goldston case, that would be the judge stepped off the bench and then stepped into the shoes basically of a police officer, of an investigator. And that's how we were able to establish liability in, in, in that case is because the judge walked straight out of the judicial branch and tried to join the executive branch. 
So, so you know, the, while a judge can issue an order directing that the executive branch go search something, even in a family law case, the judicial branch cannot go issue that order and then do it itself or just do it itself without issuing an order. And that was, that was the difference here. Um, it, it had the judge said, directed law enforcement to go search my client's house to see if certain DVDs were there or family photos were there, then we never would have been there. We never would right. have been here. It's because the judge showed up personally and not only participated in the search, but directed the search herself, Crazy. like on the scene. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody wants to get past judicial immunity, you have to fit into that sort of a fact pattern. So I guess I would ask you is, and part of the disciplinary case against Judge Goldston did find that she was basically acting as a litigant. So whereas my client was pro se and the ex-wife had a lawyer, she was kind of acting as, you know, with that lawyer, acting as a, as a litigant. That lawyer had not made the case that my client was in contempt, had right. not made the case that he had not turned over the DVDs. She was helping to make the case by her actions and what she was doing. She was basically um, no longer a judge. She was acting as a litigant. So how close can you get this judge's actions to, to look like that? When you say he was at, when you say he's been acting as a litigant, so there's, there's, he has jurisdiction. Yes. The hails are, are within that jurisdiction. There's, there's pending litigation that's properly before this judge. Yes. Like what is the best evidence that this judge has stepped down from the bench and is now acting in support or advocating on behalf of this Lynette lady, Lynette lady. Like what, what's the best fact? So the best, and help me out chat. Maybe, maybe cause uh, chat, there's a lot of what the hell's fans in the chat right now. There's almost 3000 people watching and I'm trying to think while I'm thinking maybe chat can also help me out. What is the best fact as John just said to show that judge the Thomas's, has stepped in the shoes of a lawyer. That's the first video. Yes, the first video. Uh, in the first video, what is the best evidence to show Judge the Thomasis was not acting as a judge, but he was acting as a lawyer, as her lawyer? What is one of the best facts? And the only one that I can think of that is coming to mind right now from, from the viewing is, again, uh, he... Uh, he directed her on multiple occasions. And the problem is, again, um, you know, and this is going to be the hardest part of it to prove probably. There we go. He was, that was, that was exactly what I was going to say, Jennifer Whitaker. He was guiding her answers. As she's trying to represent herself, she's like, Your Honor, I need to do, uh, I have this. And he's like, no, 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 I, I don't need that. I need you to provide me something more, like what you're providing me with is hearsay. He was leading her words. He was leading her on to, to kind of zone her in and constantly try and, and help her out in the best way possible. And I believe at one point he even cross-examines one of the lawyers for Jeremy. That's in a later hearing. At another point, he, I believe, cross-examines Jeremy himself. Uh, on November 29th, <clears throat> people are saying he totally litigated her case. But again, uh, that's not really a, a, an answer. But um, uh, Megan Megan Fox has uh, has covered this. I wonder what she's up to. If I can send her this link, um, I don't know <clears throat> if she's available to join right now. Let me see. Let me let me. Uh, well, let me let me just say while you're doing that, Larry. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just based on that. I mean, if the worst, if the best evidence against the judge is that he's being unfair to one side because he's helping the other side and he's, he's asking questions on their, on their behalf. I mean, I mean, how many cases, how many criminal cases have you tried, Larry? I mean, doesn't that, does that not sound like basic criminal defense? I mean, that not that what judges do is it, like they help prosecutors in criminal cases. You know, I mean, it, that's sort of, that's sort of been my experience. Like I, I just don't think, I don't think that alone is going to be enough because that's just that to me, it sounds like judge judges being judges. 
Like they they like to pick a side and and help one side. And in criminal cases, that's almost always the prosecutors. Like every criminal case I've ever prosecuted, the judges are are helping the prosecutors. And well, that- it, it, it's one thing to help. No, I agree with you. It's one thing to kind of just be a neutral arbiter, just kind of trying to guide the process. It's a whole other terrain, potentially. Again, I'm not saying Jeremy absolutely positively has a case here. But what I am saying is there is definitely a potential avenue. Um, oh, that's that's fine. I think Megan, Megan might be able to join. She's cooking dinner right now. I caught her in the middle of dinner cooking dinner but she may be able to pop in just for because she watched the hearing in full again my i was going in and out as i was driving so i sent her the link let's give her like a couple of minutes i think uh she's going to be able to join she has a little bit of background noise but we're going to deal with it because she is the one with the intel john so please uh bear, bear with us we'll, we'll finish this up here in a few minutes um but the essentially she watched the the first hearing i've not had the chance to watch the first hearing cover to cover yet she did it this morning on her channel so absolutely go check it out chat when you're done with this video but um i think again if there is a smoking gun if there is a smoking gun of judge the thomas is clearly being like i am lynette's lawyer without saying it there she is hey megan hey hey i know you're cooking dinner listen um basically here's here's what we're talking about um you watched the first hearing today on your channel, correct? I did. Can you tell us? So I have John John Bryan here with us. He is a phenomenal protector of the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth and Sixth Amendment. You name it, he protects it. I know of John very well. We are talking about, Megan, uh, about the first hearing when Judge DeThomasis, the one that you watched today, when Judge DeThomasis on multiple occasions acted as Lynette's lawyer. Yeah. What do we have a smoking gun? Is there a way to potentially lift his absolute immunity to show that the judge clearly was not acting in the capacity of a judge, but was acting in the capacity of Lynette's lawyer? What did you see today? Can you tell us? Yeah, I did. And I wrote down a timestamp on it, too. Let me think. What was it? I think it was the moment when the defendant's attorney asked to cross-examine her. Oh, I know. He said, since you won't let me cross-examine her, I've got two witnesses here who have been here for four hours and they want to get up and testify. So, so we don't have to call them back. Can they get up? And the judge said, you want to have her cross, a woman without a lawyer cross-examine witnesses? And he said, well, yeah, judge, I think that's how it works. She's pro se. She chose to go pro se. The judge can't protect her from her own choices to not have a lawyer. But he did. And he didn't allow those two to testify because he was determined that she was going to, I don't know, did he get her a lawyer? Did he make a deal with Silverman to get her a lawyer after that? Because she sure got one. I mean, one one of the things that Judge Goldston was accused of by the judicial disciplinary folks was because there was a pro se party involved, but it was discriminating against a pro se party. You know, treat, treating the the other party, the ex wife who had the lawyer who was friends with the judge, who was close with the judge, treating that side better and helping them, assisting them, advocating on their behalf against the pro se party who had no idea what he was doing and was just told to show up 10 minutes later to his house. So that, that was part of the, the, the allegations against judge Goldston was discriminating against a pro se party. But, you know, you don't have to do this in criminal cases, but in civil cases, the worst experiences I think I've ever had practicing law is are litigating against pro se parties. Why? One, because sometimes they're absolutely crazy, like it sounds just like like this lady is. But secondly, because judges, that's that's kind of what they do is they help pro se parties. Like they, I mean, that's not uncommon in my experience is, is judges feel like they have to assist, give a lot of leeway to pro se parties because they don't have lawyers. They don't exactly know what they're doing. So if if it's not a judge 
going against a pro se party and favoring some lawyer that they're buddies with, but in fact, just kind of assisting, even if they shouldn't be doing it, a pro se party, I don't think that's going to be enough because it's just, it's got, it's going to be hard, I think, to sue a judge successfully for anything they're doing literally like in the courtroom. Mm. Like it, it, I, I think the example of the judge literally leaving the courtroom and going to a party's, to a litigant's home and searching it is a great example of how one could lose judicial immunity because it's a very clear delineation of leaving the bench, leaving the courtroom, and then going and performing some other function. So long as the judge is doing it from the bench, I think they're going to be given the benefit of the doubt. And one of the famous cases, judicial immunity cases, is where a judge instructed a bailiff to go get this lawyer from this other courtroom and bring this other lawyer before me. And when you do it, use excessive force, be like beat the lawyer up. So th there's no dispute that the judge said that directed the bailiff to go grab a lawyer and to beat the lawyer up, to violate the lawyer's fourth amendment right to be free from excessive force. So there's, there's no dispute that the judge did that and that it in fact violated the fourth amendment rights of this lawyer. But guess what? The judge got judicial absolute immunity because the judge was still sitting on the bench and it involved a case that was pending before that judge involving that lawyer. So, I mean, that's how much leeway, that's how flexible judicial immunity is. Like it's almost always going to cover anything that happens within the realm of, of that courtroom. Like there's almost nothing that a judge could do like sitting on the bench with a case pending before that judge to end up losing judicial immunity. Like that's how, that's how, that's protected how they strong are. it is. So yeah. I think to find some sort of realistic liability here, like you'd have to find something happening outside of the courtroom or you'd have to expose some sort of a conspiracy through like extrajudicial communications, like emails between this judge and oh. the party saying, all right, we're, all right, you show up tomorrow and this is what we're going to do. You know, something sure. like that. Yeah, that would do it. But I think that would be need, the smoking gun. Yeah. I think you need something like that. And, and, and it probably doesn't exist. And so what does that leave you? And I've had this conversation with lots of people so far and they don't want to hear it, but it's, it's correct. Like the best for, for those situations, like the proper remedy, the only real remedy is a judicial disciplinary complaint. Like there are a lot of rules for judges. Every state has them and they can be very strict. So you pick your best violation. So if you mm -hmm. think the judge did something wrong, you ought to be able to match it to one of the, you know, I think they're called the canons of judicial conduct. So you take your strongest allegations, you figure out which canons of judicial misconduct the judge violated, and you mm -hmm. file a judicial disciplinary complaint. And in West Virginia, there's a, like a two-year statute of limitations to do that. I'm not sure what it is in Florida, but you probably yeah, have well, a couple of years I'll to follow. I'll tell you about Missouri. We had a bunch of bad lawyers in Missouri. I mean, not lawyers, judges and lawyers, but uh, the judges were all turned into the judicial committee there and also in Texas where there were a bunch of them. These people only look at these things once they have a public hearing once every two years. None of the judges have ever in these two places, both in the place in Texas, barely any of them have ever been, you know, sla even slapped on the wrist for the and people are waiting two, three years to hear anything out of their complaints. I think it's a terrible system. I think that the judiciary, the uh, legislature ought to do a better job by using their impeachment powers to get rid of judges because the judicial committees are not doing their jobs. Not from, not from what I've looked into and the cases that I've followed. Yeah. And, and same here. So, so let's take a look. This is approximately the, the, the smoking gun that Megan is talking about the chat mentioned. So let's see, let's see if we find anything glaring exacerbation of a prior condition of anxiety that she's currently now in therapeutic intervention and seeking assistance for that that it's persistent that it's ongoing and that it's perceived as being threatening to her safety and the safety of her family 
So that's what she said. Now, one could argue, oh, some ordinary person would just blow this off and get around, get on with their life. Hang and, up the phone. And, and I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And I suspect I'll get an argument about that. And I've read the cases you sent me ahead of time. And, you know, one was domestic, one was stalking. The domestic has a footnote that the stalking is part of domestic. And so they analyzed it that way. I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I know. But it doesn't deny and should not deprive for the ability to present it. And I'm just not going to have my clerks wait here till after five o'clock and my court security. And, and your honor, can I say something? In and, Ohio. And, what, and here's another thing, the court's concerned by, by doing so there's not a temporary injunction in place. So there's, there's no, there's no there is, intermediate. Judge. There's a permanent injunction in place. In another court. Yeah. Yes. She can't come near him. You'll right. be okay. So there's so no how did, such thing in Florida. How did the video happen the other day? Ma'am, ma'am, there's no such thing as a mutual injunction, but there's right. there's a such thing as people having independent injunctions considered on their own merits. The the, the, the the standard of law in Ohio is preponderance of evidence. The standard here is a little higher, competent substantial evidence. Um, May I say something that's pertinent to what you're yeah, talking about? Hang on. He was asked in Ohio. Can we make this a mutual order between you two? Both. He said no. I think it's he a little no. further than this. Because then he couldn't be able to do what he's doing to me. Right. Which is which is why he starts arguing Florida with the has a statutory with Feather about the witnesses. However, there is oh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. yeah. Maybe injunctions won't Yeah, I mean I I just don't think it's gonna be enough. Anything happening when within the context of that hearing in that courtroom, it's just gonna be I mean, we all have complaints about judges. Some of them are worse worse than others. It, I, I don't think that's that's going to be enough. Like it, it has to be, it has to be more extrajudicial. It has to be more outrageous. I think if you want quick justice, you're not going to get justice at all. And if you want to spend this part was pretty bad too. Six or eight too. months in an appellate court process, you, you you could end up with that, or we could hear the whole case and allow the court to make a determination on the merits of this case, and it could result. In, in, in an injunction or not. I mean, what your lawyer's saying is it's going to, it's going to result in a quick and speedy resolution with a dismissal. I, I guess he's predicting what I'm going to do. That's, that's a, that's a really hypothesis without basis. Um, I thought he was going to say outlandish statement. Could we take the witnesses that are present in the Here we go. Yeah, this is it right here. Inconvenienced again, Your Honor. We have the mayor of Otter Creek present. The mayor. We have her husband. They both like to testify. Could we do that in light of the... I didn't even know that was actually an incorporated municipality. I mean, that's like um, just... You're going to be five-minute witnesses? A gas station or something, oh, my no. recollection. You're going to have a pro se litigant try to engage in cross-examination, not even understanding what that is to ask questions? Okay, what the hell does that mean? You're going to have a pro se litigant who doesn't even understand the process asking questions. That's exactly what a pro se litigant does when they're pro se, you moron. She did it in Ohio. She she cross-examined in Ohio. Why is she not allowed to do it in this courtroom? It's exactly what she signed up for. Yeah. But I know what John's about to say. It's a it's a ruling from the bench. Absolute immunity is going to apply, aren't you, John? Yeah, I mean, that's that's litigation, right? Yeah. So, I mean, your your remedy is to appeal or file a judicial disciplinary complaint or politics. You know, you you don't like you don't like this judge. You know, we we ha they have judicial elections in Florida. Support a different judge next go around. Well, he was appointed by DeSantis four years ago, five years right, ago. He'll have to run at some point, right? It, yes, 2026. Have, yeah. I think it's a six-year term. 2026. He already or, was elected one time at, right after his appointment. The next year he was elected because he ran unopposed. Well, and now this next let, time, maybe not. But I mean, I just, I really feel like this is every bit as offensive as working against a pro se um, client, a, a pro se litigant, because look, she's been given all the admonitions. She's been told you would do better to have an attorney. So instead of just moving on with the process, he's giving her all this extra time 
Well, meanwhile, the respondent is not getting his due process. He wasn't allowed to speak in, on his behalf. His lawyer was not allowed to speak on his behalf for an entire two hour hearing. I, I just think it's crazy. And yeah, there is you know, the, the, the way, let me Go tell ahead. you the way, the, the way our case really ended other than the financial settlement, you know, so the, the judicial disciplinary process actually could not even remove a judge because they're elected. I mean, they're elected politicians. I mean, the voters put them there. So the, the Supreme Court of West Virginia can suspend a judge, but they can't just remove a judge. So who can do that? The legislature can the impeach legislature. a judge. Yep. And that's, that's what actually ended up happening in our case is the judge was not removed in the disciplinary process. And when I took her deposition, you know, I already had the West Virginia Supreme Court opinion, the highest court in our state, saying that she searched my client's house. And so when I took her de deposition, I'd say, did you search my client's house? She said, no. And I said, well, Judge, judge, the, I have a in my hand a opinion, a published opinion from the highest court in our state that says that you did search his house. She's like, yeah. And I said, so do you disagree with that? Yeah, I disagree with that. They're wrong. You know, and everything went like that. All right, you seized items from her house. No, I didn't. But the Supreme Court said you did. Yeah, well, they're wrong. And everything was like that. So she's disagreeing with everything that literally is law. Like it is law. The the, the law is now that this woman searched my client's house and she she was she was wrong. And and she, and she's she would just I say I disagree. And she's elected. So what happened? The legislature. You know, people contacted their legislators, they activated on it, and they were going to impeach her. And like they they ran it up like to the last day, they were gonna vote to impeach her, so she resigned. And so uh... while it's not easy, I mean it's not the political resolution is not easy. I mean, that's your last line of defense. You know, if if the appeals aren't gonna work, you can't sue because of judicial immunity. And if you're in a state like Missouri, like you're talking about, Megan, where there's no like real substantive disciplinary review or prosecution, then, you know, the, maybe the last thing that you can do is is get involved with politics, you know, um, contact the legislators, donate. Yeah. You know what they said to me in in, uh, in in Missouri? I went to the Capitol. We talked to senators. I took families there who had been wronged by these judges and these guardians ad litem and sat in front of the senators and Congress and the House of Representative members. And I asked them point blank, what about impeachment? Can you impeach them? And one of them leaned back in his chair and he looked at me and he goes, huh, we've never done that, have we? Have we ever done that, Bill? Have we ever done that? Yeah. And they're all sitting around the table going, no, we've never done that. We don't, we don't know. Not yet. That. It's really unfortunate. Um, well, it's, it's not easy for sure. That's why you need, it's got to be, see, it's got to be something more than it takes an hour long video to explain where you have to watch what's being said in a courtroom. And like, you have to have, you have to have some X factor that's not there. Like you have to have at least a minute long video of the judge showing up to this dude's front yard and searching his house. Like something like that. That's, that's what was able to get or traction Judge Eric Amy, in the other case. Judge Eric Amy, who marched children out of the courtroom and took them to the jail underneath his uh, courthouse and locked them up. He just lost his immunity. He's a Missouri judge who locked Is that up the, the rocket case. Yep. The rocket yeah. case. He, he just got deposed last week. Yeah. That's so that's the other good example. And that's also a, a uh, Institute for justice case. Yeah. Yeah, so let, let's see if, if there's anything else here. I think that's how it works. Since this case is so In, in time, it will work. Yes, in time. Appointed? It takes time. You, you try, you're trying to railroad it through. I, I, no, I Your Honor, I'm not that. trying to railroad it through. I'm trying to convene these witnesses court who've court been decisions. waiting four hours to testify. And I've been doing what in the past four hours? 
adjudicating the merits of about six other litigants times two because there's two in each case some were served some were not served Understood. with witnesses some without witnesses some with supporters not with supporters i don't know when we started how many people were here 25 or 30 am i insensitive to these folks having to come back no i'm not i'm but completely cognizant of it you guys want to come back on a saturday or sunday i'll be here on a saturday or sunday you want to come back at midnight we'll be back at midnight but i'm not going to put my clerks through that or my court security through that I'm just suggesting well, that we can convenience the witnesses by taking their testimony now, Your Honor, if the court would consider that. You know, the, the, the request is denied. It, 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 it's mind boggling. Am I allowed at all to get a court appointed lawyer in something no. like this? No, ma'am. It's not a criminal case. There's no, okay. there's no constitutional. There's a right to counsel. There's not a right to court appointed counsel. Now I understand I'm why sorry he. Sorry that I'm not an attorney. Want to come back tomorrow? Let's come back at nine o'clock. And I understand why. Um, I, I would note that the petition is not properly sworn. Does that matter to the court? Uh huh. Everything matters in all good time, in all due time, at the appropriate time. If you're making motions, I move to dismiss the petition because it's not properly sworn. You can make that argument tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. This judge, wow. And again, we're all coming back to that same same answer. He's making means. rulings from the bench. He's not act, acting extra judicially. But if we can catch him acting as a no, lawyer, I'm not maybe adjudicating okay. maybe a legal matter without right, I I just don't know proper that. argument presented in support. So, are we reconvening at nine o'clock? That's fine. Oh. I have a doctor's no, appointment, but I'll cancel it. Mr. Hales is having to address matters in Ohio court related. To oh, there's the. He has to be there tomorrow morning. Yeah, I remember this. He has a flight out. Well, who's who's the judge in Ohio? Why don't we reach out and see what they can do to accommodate us? What? He really thinks he can reach out to a judge at 5 o'clock. We're not going to have it tomorrow because of Mr. Hales. Is he calendar well. off his rocker? He, he just wants complete so control. Your calendar and his calendar take priority over the court calendar, which I'm willing oh, to for the love of God. to accommodate. I want the record to reflect. I'm here to accommodate these litigants and these witnesses to resolve this case. Thank you, Your Honor. And if We're it can't be done tomorrow moment. and you're asking for a continuance beyond tomorrow, I'll grant that. But I don't want anyone to be misled into thinking I'm shirking my responsibility to adjudicate this case on its merits. Your Honor, we would be grateful to stay as long as it takes. You're missing the point. It's not about you and me. We have other participants in this. In this, yes. Okay. Our court staff and our and our court security. And so, I'm shutting it down yes. in about six minutes. And if you want to come back at nine o'clock, it's offered to you all. If you can't come back or you're not willing to come back. We're going to do it next Wednesday at one o'clock, the sixth. If you have a calendar conflict, you've got a week's time to make a change in your calendar. Fine with me, Your Honor. We'll be back here Wednesday, December sixth at one p.m. I'll have to obviously maybe take a closer look at it, but I mean, I think you can see, John. This this is just one little taste of, and it gets much much worse. Um, the reason that, uh, so his lawyers, Jeremy's lawyers, Mark Feather has since been replaced with, uh, Doreen Inkley's and, uh, Randy Shockett. There are the two lawyers on the case now. Uh, Doreen is the writer. Randy is the litigator and, uh, they represent Jeremy and they filed a motion to recuse essentially disqualify what they call it in Florida to disqualify judge the Thomases. He denied it. They made a second motion to recuse. He denied it with a five page, single space, 2,600 word. I'm not coming off the bench. And here's why. Uh, then they tried a third time last week to remove him. They said, please judge, remove yourself from this case. And he said one more time, by the way, court was on Wednesday, February 28th. So just last week. And, um, it, it's 9 a.m., 9.30. Court begins at 1.30. They still don't have a ruling from Judge DeThomas. 
they nudge the clerk, say, hey, um, do we have an answer? Like, are we going to get an answer today? What's going on? And the clerk was like, okay, I'll ask the judge. Within five minutes, John, they had an email in their inbox with the judge's order saying, I'm not recusing myself for the third time now. And it was like two pages of, again, utter BS. Literally, and Megan probably dropped out. Thank you so much, Megan. I know you you probably can't hear me, but uh, <laughs> you guys go subscribe to, to her channel. Go go um, watch the video from today. She went through the full hearing. We just did a couple minutes. She did the full hearing today. So thank you so much again, Megan, for joining us. Um, so Wednesday at 9.37, John, the judge literally blindsides. It's like, oh, you want my order? Here you go. It's already canned. It was ready to go. He just was sitting on it. He waited until the last minute. Now, what he did not expect is what followed. Because eight minutes later, his lawyers, Jeremy's lawyers, file a motion to stay proceedings pending a petition for, uh, oh, God, what is it called? Um, to stay, stay proceedings for, um, the, the term escapes me right now. I'm sorry. Writ of prohibition. Writ of prohibition. Thank you. I just couldn't think of the name. Um, writ of prohibition to basically ask the, su the Supremes or not the Supremes, but uh, we go to the Supremes uh, in Florida. They go to the, the first district court of appeals to ask to remove him. And so the judge at the 130 hearing, which is now on the what the hells channel, also go to what the hells, subscribe to them and watch their latest video on the court that Jeremy posted, uh, I think, yesterday. Um, judge the Thomases was like, I'm not going to stay proceedings. I refuse. So again, he just just continues like piling on the pressure. And the hearing was supposed to be Friday. The continuation of the continuation of the continuation. This is like here. It'll be hearing number six now on this case, because again, I won't bore you with, with all the details because it's a lot. Um, and I know you don't have a lot of time. So Wednesday, the judge is like, okay, you want time? He doesn't even ask how much time do you need? Because the lawyers ask for seven days, give us seven days, just stay proceedings. Give us seven days. We'll get you a, a writ of prohibition. You know what he says? I'm giving you one day. I'm giving you until 6 a.m. This is Wednesday at like 3 p.m. I'm giving you until Friday at 6 a.m. If it's not submitted Friday by Friday at 6 a.m. Excuse me, I, said, I think I said p.m. If it's not submitted by Friday at 6 a.m., we're having our trial, you know, Friday at 9 a.m. No exceptions, no questions, no nothing. God bless Randy and most importantly, Doreen, who spends, I don't know, I don't know if she sleeps at all. She spends whatever remains of Wednesday, the entirety of Thursday. We know she didn't sleep Friday because the, the petition is submitted at 5.55 a.m. And we went over the petition on our channel. Go check it out. It's in the playlists. Um, we read it cover to cover. And it's beautifully written. Granted, there's some, er but I can't fault her. I mean, she probably hasn't slept a poor woman in like 48 hours, John. I mean, I would probably be, I'd, I'd, be, I'd probably be writing worse than her. She's a beautiful writer, very eloquent. And the judge, of course, I mean, at that point, he has no choice. The proceedings are stayed frozen in time, whatever you want to call it, whether he likes it or not. And so that's where we are now. But here's the biggest problem, John. At one of the hearings, I think it was number three or four, uh, maybe it was the January 23rd hearing, as a matter of fact, I think, because that, that one uh, 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 Megan and I did on her channel. Judge DeThomasis starts getting very angry personally with Jeremy and his lawyers and saying, Jeremy has this YouTube channel where he's making money that's his primary mode of making a living. And he's taking my hearings and fucking monetizing them. He's making like a mockery. He's embarrassing the situation. He's embarrassing the judiciary. He's embarrassing this and that. He's in violation of this order. He's in violation of that order. He's in violation of this order. And basically something that's already been adjudicated by uh, Chief Justice Mosley for the first district of Florida, because there was some... BS, again, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion. 
But essentially, judge just will he will he refuses to listen to the merits of the case, and he keeps coming back to this whole your YouTube way of making a living is 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 upsetting to me, very 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 upsetting to me, and that's why they want to remove him, and that's why they asked to remove him. But here's the problem: in order to shut Jeremy up. He took away his First Amendment, right? He said, if other people, this is unprecedented, John. This is unprecedented, cyber stalking or no cyber stalking. He said, Jeremy, I'm going to punish you if any one of your viewers does anything that basically I find offensive in any way, shape, or form, contacting the court, contacting Lynette, contacting John, whatever, John Cook, of course, not you, um, then I will hold you, Jeremy Hale, personally responsible for their speech, for their exercise of their free speech, I'm going to punish you because, again, and his biggest mistake there is he says Jeremy Hales is what the Hales' is channel, what the Hales' is channel is Jeremy Hales. They're in inextricably linked. Everything that he says or the channel says uh, or something is said on his channel is directly appropriated towards Jeremy. And that is the most unconstitutional thing about this case. Now, don't get me started about, you know, I listed the all the violations that Judge the Thomas has made in my description of, of pretty much all my videos at this point. Um, and they are numerous. Uh, essentially, you know, First Amendment right, obviously, the First Amendment right to free speech. He's now being punished for other people's speech, exercising of their speech. He's not allowed to have guns. So the temporary injunction has been granted. He can't have guns in his in his home to protect himself. So his Second Amendment right has been infringed. Thank God that our judge is not ordering the quartering of troops at his home because that would be the Third Amendment violation. But we do have a Fourth Amendment violation as well because there is a, a piece of land with an easement to access his property. And he can't use that piece of land because the judge said, go the other way because Lynette's property is right over here. It's adjacent. And he has to kind of pass by her property to, to enter his property. So that access to that easement has been closed off. That's his Fourth Amendment deprivation of property. His Fifth Amendment right to due process of law, that's an obvious one. And of course, the right to a speedy trial, a speedy hearing, a speedy resolution of his case. This has been pending since September 7th when she first filed it. The temporary injunction was put in on uh, December 4th. He has been without all these rights three months today. Three, today is the three-month anniversary. I guess we're celebrating two anniversaries, the four-year anniversary of your case and the three-month anniversary of uh, Jeremy being deprived of 50% of his constitutional rights by this rogue judge. And here's the best part, John. Here's the best part. Because of the writ of prohibition freezing this case in its place, Judge the Thomases before he involuntarily left on Wednesday, February 28th, he kept the temporary injunction in place. He renewed it because he has to renew the temporary injunction. It expires each time the next court hearing happens, it expires. So he has to renew the temporary injunction until there's a resolution. And he renewed it over and over and over again. And once again, he renewed it. And now it's, it, you know, the temporary injunction is in place until the next hearing date. When is the next hearing date? It's when the Court of Appeals in the First District rules and says, Judge the Thomases, you are out, or says, nope, everything's good. Judge the Thomases, you stay in. And then Judge the Thomases will pick a new date. And that could be April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. It could be January. Before we hear back, as you know, the courts of appeals are swamped. They do not move fast. And uh, it, it could be 2025 before Jeremy gets his rights restored. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the reason why, you know, I sometimes as much as I like to fight in court, I, you know, I have conversations with people before that kicks off. And I say, look, do you do you really want this in your life? You know, I mean, it that's how litigation can be. You know, I mean, sometimes you get bad judges. Sometimes you get difficult pro se opponents. Sometimes you get asshole lawyers on the other side who can be an absolute nightmare. I mean, sometimes you're, you're buying that when, when you enter into some sort of a dispute with a neighbor, sometimes you're buying that when you end up having a relationship with a crazy person. You know, I've asked how many times I've, I've been asked somebody's in big trouble because their spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever got them in trouble. 
you know, what can I do? Well, you you can, if we had a time machine, I could fix this for you. You'd go back in time and never enter into a relationship with that person, but we don't have a time machine. So you know, it's going to be a long, difficult road. And I mean, this just seems like that sort of a scenario to me that this is, maybe these are egregious examples of what can go wrong in, in litigation. But I, I think the larger point to me is that it's got to be something more than that. And, and what you said with the YouTube stuff. Now, I think you're, you're getting into maybe something could be done territory. I've had a little bit of that done to me because at this point in the cases that I personally litigate, I mean, the defense lawyers, the, I mean, the cops, like they know who I am. So when I notice a deposition of a defendant as a video deposition, like they see, you know, they don't just see me taking their client's deposition. They see a YouTube video of me taking their client's deposition. So I've already had it happen to where they run to the judge and they say, this, this needs to be treated differently. This can't be treated like a regular case. He can't be treated like a regular lawyer because he has this big YouTube channel and that's what he's going to do. And it's going to cause a public safety issue because last time he did a YouTube video on our client's case, our client received death threats and it's a public safety problem because our 911 center was tied up and there were angry people that shut down our Facebook page. So that's what tyrants do is, they try to shut down free speech by labeling it some sort of bogus public safety threat. And so that's how they've tried to silence me personally. And even now, like I can't just take a regular video deposition of somebody without a protective order being in place saying that I can't use that video footage until after the case is resolved. Wow. And the, the reason why that is is because try I mean trial judges have wide discretion to control the proceedings that are before them so that can you know they have the the ability to shut me up about a case that's pending before them but once that case is resolved then my first amendment rights of free speech far outweigh any public safety bullshit that they're they're bringing up so the the practical effect of that is that they can they can prevent me from making youtube videos about cases that i'm litigating so long as they're active cases that may get in front of a jury um wait, wait, but can i can i can i make a suggestion or yeah. is this is this an idiotic <laughs> what if you send them to me and i make them public? <laughs> you don't you're not doing it well, I mean, there, there are I ways. Say nothing. There are ways around that. You know, I've, I've, I've considered. I've had people contact me, and, and they'd be, they're like, "Look, I'm an anim I'm a professional animator. I can take your deposition, and I'll have like animations. Um, at, I'll have an animated John Bryan asking questions, and then I'll have an animated like like police officer who's answering." Like I've considered stuff like that. I mean, there there are potential ways around it. Like there are other 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 people could upload things. It hasn't been important enough to me to to Fair. try to get around that because you know, I'm not trying to. I don't want to hurt clients by, you know, exercising my own free, free speech rights. So I I haven't pushed the envelope well, on well, any of that. I guess, I guess my I question is, if you get a case that's egregious enough and you're not your client, now, again, I'm, uh, it's always about the client. We don't care about our YouTube channels. I, I will say this. I had my own hearing that I had to sit on for like four years, John. Four years. I, I could post it at any moment, but I had to wait for the case to be over because it would hurt my client. But I guess the question is, um, and then I posted it, of course, once the case was over, nobody got hurt. Um but I was worried that he, somebody might get hurt if I do post it ahead of time. Well, if you have a case where you absolutely positively have to, because because you're not getting your client, your client is not getting the justice they deserve. And the only way to get the prosecution, the defense, like whatever side you're on to, you know, prosecution in the criminal case or the, the defense in the civil case mm -hmm. to budge and do anything is by making it public. Where's the problem? 
Even if it means, sorry, and I'm going to take it a step further. Even if it means you are violating openly, honestly, and sincerely and directly a judicial order that says thou shalt not disseminate. I'm going to take it to the extreme. What happens then? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a I'm a huge believer in the public being able to see things. I mean, just like I mean, the right. best example of that is this family court judge search case where it would have been an almost impossible task to do anything about that. And all the things that you're describing, what's what's happening in Florida right now in this case, like you can multiply that by several times to describe what happens in family courts around this country on a daily basis, because there are no juries and you have this broad discretion held by these family court judges. And not only that, such as, Places like West Virginia, it's confidential. So, so you you know they try to stop you from uh, being able to tell people what's happening in family court just on the grounds that it's confidential. So, they have a lot of places this kind of scam going on, like a pay to play sort of deal, where you have to hire the right lawyer to get results in family courts. This has happened across the country, and then it's confidential, and and they try to keep it confidential. So. Even what you're describing there in Libby County, Florida, I've heard horror stories about the things that happen in, in family courts across the country. Mm -hmm. And it's happening all the time. And the I think the best way to combat it is for people to be, you know, to be able to put things on YouTube. And if it had to, had my case never been uploaded to YouTube, I don't think the the, it, there would have been no disciplinary case, probably. The judge wouldn't have been you know, threatened with impeachment. And I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe nothing would have happened because lots of it had been happening for 20 years before. Right. So right. I think that's a fight worth having. And sometimes you just have to decide whether that, you know, the particular hill is worth dying on. So, I mean, it. I, I mostly litigate, almost all litigate in the federal courts. And in the federal courts, generally, you don't have this problem where you have these kangaroo courts like you may have in Levy County, Florida, or in Raleigh County, West Virginia. You have, you have a much more, um, you know, you have a much more fair system than in, in the federal courts. So I don't deal with that as much. And you also, you know, you don't really defy a federal judge very easily. You know, when, when well, a federal judge it, tells you to do something, I mean, you, you, you'd, that's have fair. To, you'd have to really make a decision that it was the, you know, the right hill to die on to do it. Because I may be, I mean, chat, call me a psychopath, John, call me a sociopath, but I dream, I dream of the day in a criminal case, a civil case, I don't know, a deposition, a freaking, I don't know, a speeding ticket, whatever case. It's never going to happen in a speeding ticket case, but I wait the day. I wait the day. Do you remember, John, that that video of a public defender uh, in a courthouse? The FBI comes in and they got their phones and they're trying to take a photo of her client who's like about to be indicted in a federal case. And she's standing there blocking their view. Like, no, you're not photographing my client. You're not photographing my client. And they handcuff her and they say, you're under arrest. You are, what did they say? You're uh, obstructing justice or whatever the fuck they said. Um, do you remember that video? No. It's from like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. I was about to say, oh, it was before your time. I think you're older than me. I can't even say that. But anyway, uh, so that video went viral. Every lawyer, including me, was looking at it. I was a baby lawyer back then, like two, three years ago. And you guys, do you, Chad, do you guys remember this? Do you guys remember this case? Oh, my God. I remember it went viral, and this woman became a celebrity overnight. Oh, they wanted the phone. That's right. They wanted the phone. They wanted his phone. And she said, no, you are not getting his phone. You are not getting his phone. And um, it was it was the most amazing. And I, again, call me a sociopath. Call me a psychopath. Call me, a, 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 a you know, the, the, the die on your own hill, like you said. I dream of the day when I believe that I am 100% in the right and I'm doing things in the best interest of my client and the judge is like, deputy, take Mr. Foreman away. I dream of that when I be, that, that's the day I become a martyr. That is the day when the whole world is going to be like, they just locked up an attorney for doing his job. And there was a case uh, actually here in Jefferson County 
uh, where I practice. I forget the gentleman's name. He always used to wear a hat to court. Chad probably will not be able to do this one, unfortunately, because it was uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, um, uh, God, I can't remember his name. I remember the judge. It was in, in the 8th Judicial District here on a uh, now retired judge. So I, I won't call him out because it doesn't matter at the end of the day. But um, he was a public defender and he represented a client who was com uh, allegedly committed a felony and who was not convicted. And I believe the, the, the defense attorney kept trying to tell the judge, like, Your Honor, I have to do like my job. I have to protect his rights. I have to this, this, and the other. And the judge kept just cutting him off and said, No, no, you, you're you're done here. And he said, No, Your Honor, I have to finish my sentence. You can't, you I need to no, you're not fin no, you're not doing it. No, Your Honor, you don't understand. Like I, and they just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the judge put him in timeout. And what is timeout with a judge? Deputy, take him away and put him in the little. He, he didn't like put him in a cell or nothing, but he put him in that you know in a courthouse. Those of you who have never been to a courthouse, there's like a little door where all the inmates come in and come out, uh, and there's all the cells over there. And there's that one little chair. There's one little chair. It's called the timeout chair. Literally, it's called. It's probably the the nickname for it. It's the 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 timeout chair for anybody who the judge wants to like put in time out for 30 minutes, an hour, three hours, as long as the courtroom is open. She's not locking them up or he's not locking them up, but they're basically like in time out. They're in custody. They're in the court custody. They're in the custody of the court. And that public defender became known to everybody knew the story, including myself, how the judge put him in time out. Like I don't remember how long it was 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, but his freedom was taken away. He could not leave just because he tried to defend his client and the judge refused to listen. It's a very, very famous situation. Again, like I said, on a now retired judge. But um, this was in, here in Louisville, uh, in Jefferson County a few years ago. I want to say maybe 2016, 2017, uh, Division 8. And um, that uh, nothing happened to the judge. People are asking, what happened to the judge? Nothing. Nothing happened to the judge. He was acting under the color of his uh, authority or her authority. Uh, again, I don't want to reveal the, the gender of the judge because it doesn't matter. Uh, but what matters is the the martyr that he became after that. Everybody, he became a hero. He became an absolute hero. And because he was in the right, he believed he was in the right. He did the right thing. And I don't know. And, that, and that's my problem with judges who rule improperly. And again, I know, preserve for appeal, yada, yada, yada. You know, you're still an officer of the court. Somebody in the chat was like, Actually, John, uh, both calling both me and you that it's an insult to us to call us officers of the court because we're everything but in the sense of officer of the court means you're like you're like a friend of the court. You're like a friend of the prosecutor. You're an officer of the court. We are we are the last line of defense of the Constitution. And so that's why I think they're like officer of the court is almost like a demeaning, degrading statement, you know, calling you buddy, buddy with all these people who we dislike and disagree with. So I'll take that as a compliment, but um, yeah. Well, you know, Larry, one of, one of the good things about being a plaintiff's lawyer like myself, you know, it's, when filing civil lawsuits is to a certain degree, like I can pick judges that I choose, you know, I can choose to be in front of certain judges and not in front of others. So you, you can, you can kind of predict, you know, what you can choose not to be in state court somewhere where it might be a kangaroo court and instead you can just be in federal court where you know what you're getting some judges may be better for you other judges may you know be less good for you but you, you're okay with with what you're getting and and so you're willing to work in that environment and that's kind of where i find myself you know i'm i'm not there's a reason i mean all day long, every day, I could go to family courts around West Virginia that people want me to go to and, and, and get involved in litigation there because people have seen this case and said, all right, I want to hire him to come in my family court in XYZ County in West Virginia. But am I going to go? No. And just like I'll tell people, like, you don't want me to be your lawyer in some family court in West Virginia where your judge hates my guts because he can make your life a living hell in my life of living hell. I'm not going to subject myself to that. I'm not going to subject you to that. So I have some control over where, you know, where I'm going to, you know, subject and, and myself I guess that's to where, jurisdiction somewhere. When you, this is where you and I differ because I, I love, I eat 
I eat their ego for breakfast, John. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm probably. But you also guy. get to litigate on video. Remember, in federal right, court, fair. we don't yeah. get. We have no videotape. We. I love when the judge is just like, to. "Oh, local counsel, good morning. Oh, yes, absolutely. Do my case. Da, da, do their case. Da da da. Oh, another local counsel. Yes, come on up. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Oh, public defender. Oh, hey, buddy, come on up. Show me your case. Who the hell are you, Mr. Foreman? Yeah, where are you from? Uh huh. Yeah, okay. And um, yeah, we're doing your case. Okay. Mm. Oh, you're right. No, no, no more continuances. This case has gone on long enough. We are going to get a trial date immediately. We're going to litigate this case. Arr! And I'm like, oh, please, Judge, give me. I am. I'm like soaking it up. You're 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 giving me that ego boost that, that I need, man. So I, I'm sorry. It to me, that's. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm probably there's probably something wrong with me because I enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true. I'm a litigator. I like to be in the fire. I like to to stick my hand in and see if it burns. And and if it does burn, I go, well, how hot can it burn before I actually have to remove my hand? That's me. Yeah, I mean it. it you know, John's it, like I. I, you, he, yeah, I made John I think I've, I've, I've done that. I think I've 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 done that. You know, to to the extent that I you know I want to do it like. At, at this point, I enjoy being in federal court because, like, you, you you have judges that have, like, an army of law clerks, plenty of staff, and the rules are followed. You know what you're getting. Yes, you know, the, the deadlines are, are enforced, and it may not be the easiest thing to do, but you're treated with respect, and I, I enjoy – I like to be treated with respect. Um, whereas I've had bad experiences going into state court somewhere and you get like what I call the welcome stranger tax. And mm. I, I just, I don't have to deal with that. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. Um, yeah, it may be fun to fight sometimes, but. But we're in different territory. You are in organized, structured, you know, level headed territory. I'm in the wild, wild west. I'm in the district courts. Literally every judge is like, it's like opening up a can of, of, of spam. You don't know what you're going to get. You may get a toe, like a, like a, a pig hoof. You may get like a, a horse ear. You don't know what you're going to get in your spam this evening, you know? And, and for you, every time you open it, it's like a can of Coke, you know, Coca-Cola is going to be in that can. If that's, that's the best analogy I can think of on the fly. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to, 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 uh, be surprised with anything I'm, I'm trying to file you know at this point like i'm filing a case i know i can win because i've i've done it before several times and and uh and and i'm confident in it but there you know yeah. there, there are times when i get a wild hair to take something on unusual and that's what this case was this family court judge case and from day one i didn't know if, if we could win and i didn't care if we could win because i knew it was the right thing to do and even if i spent a whole bunch of time and money and lost like i was okay with that from day one and 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 uh i think that's part of the reason why i think it was successful be, because it was you know it, yeah. i think there was a certain confidence there but um anyways my wife is texting me oh that, you're good man i, I kept you way is, longer than i anticipated waiting for me so i, I, I am so sorry go. <laughs> it, no it's already past your bedtime you should have been it asleep is. by now <laughs> john cheers to you 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 fucking beast bro i i swear on my channel so i'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable but i fucking love you man you are you are the real deal you are a litigator in your own right you do you do fantastic work and congratulations on the $200,000 for your client. Cheers to that. Thanks, Larry. I appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll have you back on here soon. And maybe one day I'll go on your channel as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Let's do it. All right. We'll talk to you later, man. All right, man. See you guys later. Thanks for watching. So let's take care of some super chats um, since I saw a bunch of questions you guys have. So I apologize if you had questions for John. But uh, unfortunately, he's not going to be able to be here uh, for this. He's got to go uh, take a nap or go to bed or get some food, as his, he said his wife has prepared. So God bless him. God bless this man. And may he live a long, full, healthy life. Uh, Jermaine Downs says he opined that Ohio court ruled against her in bad faith. That is, yep, that's, yep, that's definitely part of it. 
Uh, the best fact is guiding Lynette, that the Thomases is guiding her and providing her with the law, plus not recognizing the Ohio protective order, says Susan Scataregia. Uh, also, Susan says, I feel this has gone beyond pro se help. Grudge judge has been partial from day one. And again, as you heard, the man himself who litigated a, a, a First Amendment, excuse me, um, a, a, a judicial immunity case start to finish with the Institute for Justice, the IJ. Um, I mean, maybe maybe we need them on this case, huh? Maybe we need to reach out to the Institute for Justice. It's been on my to-do list. I'm not going to lie. It's actually right here. I'm looking at it right here. I wrote it down, Institute for Justice, and I made that note on February 29th in my in my Google Notes. Um, so uh, it's it's been on my to-do list, but it hasn't really been um, it hasn't really been uh, you know because I'm not I'm not the lawyer on this case. Jeremy has not hired me. I've just been kind of covering it from the sidelines, and his lawyers are doing fantastic work, so he doesn't really need me. But if we're gonna go pierce judicial immunity of Judge the Thomasis and sue him in this personal capacity for trying to act as her attorney, I mean, we have to go through the footage. We have to see if there's something here, and maybe they'll be willing to assist if there's something here. If we can, uh, you know, uh, sue Judge the Thomasis civilly, I mean, that would be fantastic because then John. Uh, excuse me, Jeremy can go after, uh, instead of just going after Lynette, he can go after Judge the Thomases, and that's huge. That is absolutely huge. Uh, Pepper NC says, Fox, uh, John grew up in Levy County. Florida is a state police. Yep. Uh, she already left at that time, and she's left already, so I am sorry you didn't get the chance to share that with her. Uh, Harriet Williams, welcome back. Buckle up. Don't the judge's actions at least prove bias? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think bias goes without saying. It's just, can we sue his ass is the question. Can we sue him for his misconduct? And that's that's a different problem. Uh, Brian Watkins says, Larry, tell John about her pleading the fifth during the deposition and get his re... Oh, he already left. I'm sorry, Brian. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that would have been a fantastic question for John, but it, we just, we had so much fun. I, I lost complete track of time. I can't believe this has only almost been two hours, you guys. I can't believe this is, it feels like I've been here for five minutes. When I get into something like this, it's like time just flies. It disappears from me. Um, so I'm sorry for that. I'll ask him next time or maybe off screen and let you know what he says. Uh, Dwayne Norvell says, judge will not let them get a depo from Lynette. Yes. Again, bad judicial acts is not enough. Janet Kisner, thank you for the super sticker. Dwayne Norvell says he said he will not make her finish her depo. Yep. Making bad judicial rulings over and over and over. Thank you, Karen Bamberg. Uh, Chris T is, uh, says if there is already a permanent injunction in place, there isn't, it's a, it's a temporary to infinity. It's not permanent. It's a temporary till date unknown. It's not permanent. It's a temporary we're in limbo. I know it sounds so weird, but in legalese, that's literally what it is. If there's a injunction in place, why is the temporary one being heard? I think I just answered that. Um, Debbie Childers, God bless both of you. That's to me and John, I presume, unless you're including Megan in there. Uh, proud anti of 2NL. Hey, Larry and John, isn't Jeremy's Eighth Amendment right breach too? Too high of a punishment for by having a temporary injunction for over six months. Well, three months, not six. But yes, we're getting close to another uh, violation. So no protecting himself, George, and own land. Hashtag asking for a friend. That's hilarious. Um I mean, I, I know you guys have been um, have been asking if we can throw in the Eighth Amendment in there. So excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. I mean, are we at the realm of cruel and unusual punishment, chat? What do you all think? Because he's being he's not really being punished yet. He's just being deprived of his rights. I guess you could lump it into the category of punishment. I mean, chat seems to think so. Uh, we're getting there. See, that's what I'm saying, Snoopy. We're getting there. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Um, they, we're getting there. So I think you guys are on the money. I mean, chat is never wrong. If there's anything I've learned, by the way, if there's anything I've learned from, uh, from YouTube is that chat is always right. Chat is never wrong. So uh, is it the eighth? I mean, see, people are saying, no, it demeans the eighth amendment. Uh, there's people are saying we're getting there. Some people are saying, yes, I disagree. 
I disagree. Now, this statement I agree with. Dadston says, DY guy is the best lawyer alive. No, I'm just kidding. I'm tooting my own horn. Uh, yes, it is an unusual punishment, but it's cruel and unusual. Is the judge being cruel? I mean, he's trying to – he's got to protect Lynette. I know it sounds stupid. Like, what kind of protection does she need? Well, the judge doesn't know that. The judge doesn't know that because he hasn't gone through the freaking merits of the case yet. Oh, my God. It's such a weird, weird case. Purple Pro says, are magistrates immune like a judge? Uh, depends. It depends on what kind of magistrate they are. Some have qualified immunity. Some may have absolute immunity. Some may have no immunity at all, depending on which magistrate it is. Uh, Larry Sybin says, uh, should you be locked up? This is a start to help. Never use the hashtag. Yes, daddy. <laughs> Never use the hashtag yes daddy while in sent from a friend. My brother, thank you so much. You made me laugh. I, I think I almost shed a tear from laughing. That was that was not I was not expecting that. That's freaking hilarious. Um, Debbie Childers, Larry, they have a permanent injunction in Ohio. Yes, against Lynette, not against themselves, obviously. Um, Thomas Sawyer, thank you for the super sticker and thank you, Cindy, as well. By the way, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell so you get notified anytime you, we get new videos like this one up. And join on as a member if you're so inclined. We're about to go through all of our memberships. We have 23 new members. Oh, my goodness. We're going we're gonna to do this as speedily as we can. You guys ready? Marquita Cassidy, welcome as a new member to the channel. Same goes for you, Robert Henderson, a Sapphire Sky, and Tie Cutting, and World Explorer, as well as I Have Questions, and Joan Feather, and F Fat As, and Marquita Cassidy, and Dumil Van Quatre, and Russell Robinson, and Clara Smith, and Chris Weaver, and Wendy Taylor, as well as Deborah Sells, Matt Bond, and I think some of these are duplicates, but whatever, Angela Australia, Angel Australia, excuse me, and Irina Berzina, as well as Sassy Guinea Pig Mama, Wendy Bono. These are definitely new ones. Kim, Cheyenne, Lynn, and Proud Auntie of 2NL. Thank you so much for joining on as members to this channel. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, John is fantastic as well. This has been... Um, I have to keep subscribing. By the way, if you're not, if, if check your subscription, if you're accidentally unsubscribed, sometimes YouTube does this weird thing. Subscribe. Make sure that you're still subscribed. If you hit that notification bell, because a lot of people also say they don't get notified, they hit the notification bell, but they don't get notified. Well, the thing is, you have to hit that notification bell. And then when you hit it, you also have to, um, uh, excuse me, uh, you have to select all because there's like personalized, none, unsubscribe, and there's all. So if you subscribe and you hit that all bell, you're always going to be uh, notified of the um, of the videos. So make sure to double check that YouTube does not. Sometimes it's messy. I mean, their algorithm and all that, they'll, they'll accidentally, you know, uh, remove you. So make sure you double check that you are still... Um, uh, the bell has to be black. Again, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And hey, Lisa, welcome. Welcome back. Welcome back. So, um, okay. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. I mean, I had a lot of fun. I actually never had John, even though John and I are friends off screen. We've talked before many, many moons ago, and, and we've been kind of kept in touch ever since. Uh, go go subscribe to, to John's channel at... Uh, the civil rights lawyer on YouTube at the civil rights lawyer. Maybe the mods in the chat can um, uh, uh, shout out the link before I go off. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really, really hope that uh, you all have enjoyed this show. This has been absolutely spectacular to have John on because I think I think that John is a very interesting personality. He's a he's an attorney like myself first and foremost. And he also has a YouTube channel. I kind of, you know, poked him a little bit. I asked him, uh, are you, you know, is this your hobby? And he kind of all but said, oh yes, you know, this is, this is kind of like a side gig, but it also, if you remember, it also was absolutely his, um, 
his uh, way of being able to communicate, his way of being able to communicate the wrongdoings of the system to the public. So it's more than that. It is not just simply, oh, yeah, it's fun and I make money on it. You heard John from the horse's mouth. John is the real deal. John is like, you know, he's like, um, he's, um, he's a warrior. Here's an absolute warrior. And God bless him and everything that he does. Um, hashtag buckle up, Judge the Thomases. I mean, it's, it's. It continues. It's going to continue to go. The train keeps on training. The truck keeps on trucking. Uh, the boat keeps on ch ch chewing. I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm losing I'm losing track of my own uh, analogies. So anyway, I think I think Tug is getting ready to go live. So you know what? I'm going to push you guys all to uh, Tug's channel right now. Hopefully, he's going to go live in the next minute or so, and you all are going to be able to see. Uh, what that umbrella guy has to say about what the hell is this. Megan Fox is going to be joining him as well. So you all have fun. Uh, also, real quick, before I sign off, uh, Sharon Kobach, thank you for joining on as a member, as well as Just Sandy. And uh, Patricia Brown says, did the Thomasus use the word punishment? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that he did. So maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. Um I hope you all, again, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, join on as a member. Next time, Super Chat if you have questions. And uh, I always, 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 always read Super Chats. And you stay real too, James Forbes. I love you guys. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. I hope you learned something tonight. And uh, see you, well, you will see Tug on Tug's channel. Bye, everybody.